ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Willen Formiller, and I work for the Estes Valley Watershed Coalition as the Program and Development Coordinator. Just a quick reminder, we are recording today's talk, so if you're interested in receiving a link, please let me know. I'd like to share some quick background about the Estes Valley Watershed Coalition and the Wandering Wildlife Society. In 2015, the coalition was formed to help coordinate and implement flood restoration projects following the 2013 flood. Currently, we are working on healthy forest and watershed restoration projects in the Estes Valley, including coordinating resiliency projects with many area partners. In 2019, the EVWC board decided to form the volunteer-based Wandering Wildlife Society to support the protection of wildlife and their habitat throughout the Estes Valley. The Wandering Wildlife Society does this through educational outreach about safe wildlife viewing during elk calving and rut seasons, working with partners such as the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute to build and place bluebird boxes around Estes. We also host monthly wildlife talks and much more. We're excited to have Jared, who's the owner and guide of Yellowwood Guiding. Jared has been offering Estes Park tours since 2007. With a degree in environmental interpretation, he has worked for the National Park Service in Delaware and as a naturalist for the Laramie River Ranch. This evening, Jared will discuss coyotes' diversity, geographic range, and their role in the ecosystem. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jared. Howdy, everybody. Um, let me go straight to the pictures because you don't need to look at me. I got pretty stuff to look at. So the title of the, of, the, of the talk was Coyotes in the, um, you know, the, the, the un misunderstood species. And so it's one of those fascinating things from a research standpoint, they are without a doubt one of the most understood animals across the ecosystem in North America because we've blamed them from a lot of problems. We, um, we view them as an enemy quite often. And I always look at them as the exact opposite. To me, they are the quintessential dog. And if you like dogs, you love coyotes. And so one of the things I love to talk about and one of the things I hear from clients all over the world, but especially all over the United States, is uh, I saw a coyote and my response to them is, of course you did, they're everywhere. And that's where this becomes really fascinating. They are just about everywhere. And so when you look at a map of the United States and North America, a lot of people have a misconception that they're only in certain areas of the country. And originally that was true. Lewis and Clark's the one who identified them to science. And if you look at this picture here, it shows the, the ranges over time of how they expanded. And so in that pre European contact phase, they were mostly in the Rocky Mountain range into the Great Plains, and they had a massive habitat change. And that massive habitat change had a lot to do with people. You know, humans definitely interacted. And one of those big things we did was shoot their major competitor and killer, the gray wolf. And so as soon as the gray wolf died off, they went everywhere. And today there's, there's 19 subspecies of coyotes across the United States with a new one literally evolving in our own lifetimes uh, on the East Coast. And so, you know, our mountain coyote here in the mountains is a very distinctive animal, very different than what you'd find um, across the board, but you'd only notice these differences if you travel enough to see all the different types of coyotes that are across the, the country. And so one of those lovely things I always talk about is where do coyotes live? Um, everywhere, like everywhere in that picture, you could potentially find coyotes, you could find coyotes all the way down to the ocean, to the top of the mountains. They live everywhere. And the problem with that when you research them and study them is that they have a Catholic diet. Literally the first study ever published about coyote diets uh, uses that phrase and every book quotes that exact comment as well. They eat everything. And so when people ask me about coyotes, the number one thing I say about, you know, what they do and how they work is they eat cute, fuzzy things wherever it is, and they will eat all types of other things across the board as long as it's edible. And so we'll definitely go into their diet a little bit more, 
But I want to go off of this idea of my observations um, in years past. The coyote population has definitely changed, but coyotes generally have a territory that they're going to uh, defend and monitor and move around in. And so uh, over the years, especially about a decade ago, the coyotes were very active in certain areas and I was able to observe changes and, and, and behavioral changes. And so I wanted to share a few maps of, of the edge of the national park here um, to talk about one particular pack. So this, this pack that I observed the most was around Moraine Park and they're the easiest to find um, in general, especially in the past. And so it seems based on where you watch them uh, scent mark mostly through peeing and where they would do territorial patrols. You would spend a, a lot of time being able to see them in Moraine Park, in Upper Beaver Meadows, and along the park roadways. And so you take a little bit of observation, do a little bit of research, and you find that the average coyote has a range uh, territory size of about two to four square kilometers. So I took the map, measured square, square uh, uh, kilometers and or pardon me, square miles, and threw it onto a system to try to figure out if this was a realistic observation of a single pack or multiple packs, and took this idea to try to judge where should I find den sites and where could I find them, you know, because they're an animal a lot of my clients would like to see. Sadly, in the last about six or seven years, my coyote sightings have gone way down, and we can talk about that in the future here uh, in the presentation, but the fascinating thing to me is this, uh, the red dots are den sites in the past. And you could see that the, what the research generally shows is coyotes are gonna try to have a den site somewhere towards the center of their territory. And so if anybody remembers back in Moraine Park, we had this amazing coyote den uh, out in the middle of the meadow. They were far enough away from people that they didn't generally get out there. It's generally very wet at that time of year. And so right after that, wonderful denning season. Uh, the Bear Lake Road construction started that next year and then they moved right next to the visitor center. And so that was an even better, more convenient den site. And then we had the Fern Lake fire in 2012 and they moved almost entirely to the very edge of, the, of this boundary line. And so what I was trying to figure out across this observation is where do they go uh, in, around the national park and around the edge of Estes and so just at looking at, at habitats and ranges, these look like the different pack areas that I observed in the past. Um, in today's world, I don't get enough sightings to say, oh, this is definitively the line. And sadly, uh, no one wants to study coyote behavior this way because we're not really afraid of them dying off. We generally study animals that are dying off, and especially from a national park perspective. And so this is just rough observation. But it gives them a good idea that there's definitely a pack that live around town and roam around the town areas and pick some of the major valleys along the way. But it's a fascinating thing to think about that this is a pack animal that defends territory. And whenever you see that group, it's a family, which I think is, a, is really, really cool. So one of those misconceptions I love to talk about. Almost everyone brings up the story of how the coyotes are yipping and howling and going crazy. And the next thing they say, is always cringeworthy in my mind because they say they must have killed something. And my instant reaction is, why would you tell everyone that you just killed something right here? And what's amazing is that vocalization that we most frequently think about with coyotes is actually that family getting together and being happy, but also defending territory from those other coyotes in other territories nearby. And so we get a whole lot of this vocalization, the yipping, and so there's actually a number of different communications that they use, but most of the time it is territorial. Um, when they kill something, they don't make a sound really at all besides the practice of eating it. And so looking at them, they'll have a joker red smile if they're on a carcass or something like that. But most of the animals that they're killing out here in, in our ecosystem are cute little fuzzy animals that are honestly two or three bites. Occasionally they take some deer and we'll get deeper into the, the actual prey, but the vocalizations I always like to talk about are the ones that we misidentify. But where you gotta start with coyotes is their scientific name literally translates to the barking dog. And so they absolutely bark. And so that bark is an aggressive sound, generally to say, hey, you're in my territory, um, especially if you're by food. I've, I've only ever been barked at by a coyote one time 
uh, I was examining an elk carcass in Moraine Park and uh, I didn't realize a coyote had walked up behind me and he gave me a bark and I walked away and let him chew on that elk. But as they go through their, their practice, we, we hear that, you know, the song dog song in that evening time quite often. And that is almost always the family getting together. That is the family hunting individually and then coming together to vocalize, to say, I'm over here, where are you at? When the family does get together, they can do something called the group yip howl. And that is that yip, yip, yip howling call that we often associate with coyotes so much. And that vocalization is quintessentially saying, we're happy together as a family, but also whoever else is listening, this is our territory, stay out. And so the larger the pack, which is basically mom, dad, and the kids, the more that you can defend specific good territories and good food opportunities. And so this is something that's always in flux and especially in our ecosystem, it fluctuates a lot by the prey and by flooding and fires and all the different changes that we've had over the years. But it's one of those things to keep in mind to listen to those vocalizations. And it's almost always about the group defending their territory or coming back together because they often hunt alone or in very small groups. And so you got to just find out where the family is. So that lone howl is just saying, hey, I'm over here. And I think that's a, that's a very cool idea that we sadly demonized. But from this pack idea, um, whenever you see a group, the word pack has been misused quite often. And actually the, one of the lead researchers who brought up the idea of packs and wolves um, likes to refute his own research to say that packs are mostly families. And so in coyotes, the research is extremely strong that it shows that when you see a group of two or more coyotes, that is a family that owns a territory. And so you're looking at mom, dad, and the kids. And so one of those really amazing ideas is in very stable ecosystems, if there's enough food and there's enough opportunity, coyotes can actually keep their kids around for up to two years after they've been born. And those younger coyotes will learn from their parents how to be a good parent themselves. And when they do finally disperse and move to a different ecosystem, their pup survival rate goes up almost 40%. And so keeping a nice, stable, healthy area is really important to keeping happy coyotes. And sadly, it's exactly the opposite of what most of North America's coyote population control system is against. If you shoot them, you shoot a family member and they start doing some potentially bad things. But that's the, the thing I cannot stress enough is they are a family of dogs that live together. And that's just awesome. I mean, who doesn't like to see a big family of dogs? So when you're looking around throughout the season, one of those things to look for is, is how many do you see together? And so quite often the pack dynamic is going to change sometime in the early mid winter in that December to January phase. You might have seen in the past few months, uh, multiple coyotes in, in any one area, and then they might dissipate to just one or two. And that's mom or dad on defending that territory. And if the kids, don't qualify. Mom and dad really decide who's going to keep um, the kids around, which kids get to stay. Um, one of my favorite terms is the transient juveniles um, will sometimes just get kicked out and you'll see these individual coyotes roaming huge territories over a hundred kilometers away from where they grew up. Um, but whenever you see that group, it's a family. And I, I, like I said, I think that's so awesome to watch a family go on patrol and defend. Um, the other thing is they're going to raise those kids together as a group. And so one of my favorite observations I've ever seen is watching the kids from last year bring food to the puppies. And you might have six adult coyotes and then another seven or 10 uh, puppies out there in one area. And then they all slowly dissipate into the ecosystem um, as you watch them move out to go hunting, generally mice, nine times out of 10. And so the other thing you got to talk about is if you have a pack, you're going to defend a territory. And so you're going to defend that through vocalization and then also a lot of scent marking. And so everybody has seen a dog urinate on the fire hydrant or that idea. And so we see coyotes do this all the time. And it's the same thing a dog does. But in the coyotes, they have um, a very aggressive scent glands to do document that this is mine. And not only do the scent glands work to show territory, but you can actually identify the animal, how healthy they are, roughly uh, how old they are, and if they've been having kids or not. 
And so there's a lot of information in that scat, in that urine. And so I always like to think about it. It's, uh, it's sort of animal communication by Facebook, but mostly through bathroom services. Um, and so they do a lot of that marking, uh, mostly with their urine and their feces. And so just like, again, most people have seen a dog kick it up as they walk out. This was a Yellowstone coyote kicking up after that defecation and spreading that scent to make sure everybody can know that that was my territory. Uh, everybody else stay out. Um, the other thing we got to talk about is how coyotes drastically change their look. And so we get so many people from Texas and the Midwest, and they always say that our coyotes here look so much bigger and healthier. And it's because it's colder. They have to be, they are a different subspecies. And so if you watch our coyotes throughout the year, in the summertime, they do look pretty ratty and kind of scrawny at times. But if you look at a winter coat coyote like this guy, they are amazing, just beautiful, good sized, about 35 pound dogs out there hunting all those cute fuzzy things. And so one of those really important things in the next decade or so, we might start getting more wolf sightings. And so one of the key ways to always identify a coyote is red on the nose and red behind the ears. So always watch for that. Black tick tail can also help you out, but look how big and fluffy that coat is. Really good example of staying warm. If you go down here and head on, you know, it is a robust animal. You could definitely see why Lewis and Clark would have thought it to be a prairie wolf is their original name. And so big, beautiful winter coyote. And as we move through the seasons, you can see this coat start to change as we get more into that late winter phase, more in like February. Coat's still really robust. And then oh, I should say, um, I, I will have a few uh, pictures that are a bit graphic. Um, and so if anyone's disturbed, don't be afraid to close your eyes. Uh, from back during the elk culling phase in the, in the early 2010s, uh, this was a, a coyote feeding on the gut pile uh, and specifically the liver of one of the elk out in Moraine Park. But nice, big, beautiful coat, a nice mouthful of liver in action. Come into the springtime, more like now, and they're going to start to thin out a little bit. Uh, temperatures start going up. And so as many of us know, a lot of our animals look eh, kind of ratty and bad because they're starting to switch from a winter coat that keeps them exceptionally warm in the wintertime to a summer coat that you need to lose a lot of heat. Um, and so as we start moving through the season, they just start to thin down. Body weight doesn't change drastically through the year. Uh, there is definitely a adding weight in the wintertime, but that coat really hides a lot of that relatively small dog features. And so when you get to the summertime, we get this nice, thin, sleek animal out there hunting in the grasses. So this would be a view more of like August time. So they have a drastic change in body size. And so uh, almost never do people in, in August, I find, confuse them for a wolf. But those wintertime animals definitely could look like a, a really good sized dog. And so the other thing I always love to say is if you haven't got a really close look at one, they have some of the most expressive eyes and a bright white belly. So always, you know, sometimes I'll see them out in the distance, just a bright white belly. And like I said, it's just a wonderful dog. Excuse me. As we start to hit fall, that coat's gonna start changing again, getting back to that winter coat. And so it's a fascinating transition to watch them go as you go from winter to summer back to fall. And so this idea, is another thing we have to talk about, not just what do they look like coat wise, but their behavior of what they're doing. And so there's many Native American legends that coyote is immortal, not because coyote doesn't die, coyote always comes back to life. And a part of that is their reproductive system. They are what we call a meso predator. They're in the middle of the ecosystem. They're not apex predators like wolves. They're on the middle side. Apex predators generally have a very slow reproductive rate, whereas meso predators generally have a nice middle to quick reproductive rate. And so the faster you kill them, the faster they'll reproduce. And so in that December mating season, from December into mid-January, usually in this area, we'll find that our coyotes are going to go around and sniff and the other scent marks that they don't find can lead to more pup production. And so uh, babies are tied, uh, pups numbers are directly tied to how much food there is and how much competition there is. And so one of the grand ironies of coyotes is the more you shoot them, the faster they reproduce. And so 
this exact behavior here is something I love to talk about is they're always looking out for death behind them. And this legend comes from the Cato people of Arkansas. And so the, the Indian legend goes that the great spirit made the world and it was much like the Greek idea of Prometheus that there was no death. And so as the world started to fill up, the animals and the people started to fill the land and there was becoming less and less space and less area for everyone to share. And so Coyote, the wisest of all animals came up with the idea that we should have death in, incorporated into life. And that would make us appreciate the life we had and then share it for our children in the future. But of course, on the day that the witch doctor came to make that death happen, Coyote was the only animal to not show up. And so because of that, Coyote is always looking over his shoulder, looking for death to be behind him. And so that immortal idea of Coyote being behind them is a perfect example here. And so whenever you're watching coyotes, it's always really fun to watch as they stop and almost always look back over their shoulder. It's a behavior that the Cato people recognized, but in reality in modern research, we show that it's a lot about them looking out for wolves behind them. And so we release them from their wolf predators quite often, and now they've spread just about everywhere. Um, coyotes still pretty darn immortal. And so uh, if we're going to talk about this animal, you got to talk a lot about what they're doing. They have an incredible value to the ecosystem, but how are they hunting and what are they hunting is a huge misconception. Nine times out of 10 in most ecosystems, they're going to be eating medium to small fuzzy things. And so there's a whole litany of animals I'll, I'll show pictures of, but the process of hunting is really fun to watch. And so here in most of the region of the Rocky Mountains, hunting is gonna be mostly the form of mice um, voles, shrews, uh, we definitely have ground squirrels that they'll go after. And then if they can find it, carrion is a huge part of their diet. Uh, and so in the past, that was a big element in especially Moraine Park. A lot of research showed that coyotes in Moraine Park would eat a lot of elk carrion. But the thing that's always really fun to watch, if you see a coyote stalking, you will see the ears are rotating and moving around. Coyotes actually use their eyes as their main source of sensing and then they move from their eyes to their nose to their ears. And so they're gonna smell out that potential rodent. And so if you see that coyote stalking, you'll see that stop, look, and then they're in the process of smelling and hearing. So what you'll watch is the ears, how do they move? If you ever see the ears move straight forward, that's when they're zoning in and trying to find exactly where is that rodent that they're gonna to try to pounce on. And then what you watch for is the tail. The tail will slowly rise and in that process right as it hits a peak about their back that's when they leap and so it's exactly how i helped my client take this picture uh, this was the second time the coyote leaped because the first time my client was scratching his nose when he missed that wonderful moment but it is really amazing to watch what they do as they leap they're going to generally pounce with their front legs uh, hold on hold that prey down with their paw and then bite and so if you're out there watching, especially in the fall when the grass is hard, high, it's really difficult to see what's going on until you only know when they pick up their head. And then the other thing to watch for is tail. And so one of those really interesting behaviors is tail wagging is a huge part of animal communication. And for coyotes, they're generally going to keep it at about a 45 degree down when they're normally moving. But if things are good, like any happy dog, they're going to wiggle your tail nice and high. And the whole mindset is your partner that might be hunting in the same meadow can see you that you caught food, especially if you're going to bring that back to the family. It's a nice positive communication. So this is a series of pictures uh, that I took of this coyote pouncing. And so it's really awesome to watch the process. Um, they leap up, get some nice height, and the whole idea is to come straight down. When we study predator uh, behavior, we find that a lot of predator behavior is very unsuccessful somewhere between 20 to 30%. But what's always fascinating when you look through a cycle of pictures like this is how they go over a near perfect parabola and come then straight down, nose first, and then pause right before they land, just like an osprey, they will put out their paws and try to hold down that rodent. And so there is definitely this butt last picture that you'll get from every experience. And then they land, and then the next moment is to see what's going on with that tail or the head, and they usually disappear in the grass. 
And so that's a successful mouse catch. It's pretty hard to see the mouse in that picture, but it is so awesome to watch them fly. And so here's another good example of this flying process as they leap. And then if that mouse or rabbit or whatever's running, they'll stay behind it and they can run pretty darn fast. It's about 38 miles an hour um, on their top speed. And so you can watch them follow things along. And so we'll keep, like I said, keep an eye on those ears and the tail, see what's going on for success as they fly across the landscape. And then this one, I never got the picture of him being successful or not. But if you're talking about food, like I said, they eat everything. Every ground squirrel, every chipmunk, birds, they eat literally anything they can find in their ecosystem. And so that's what makes them very hard to define is they're very ecosystem based. What a coyote eats here is gonna be very different than the coyotes that eat down in the plains. The coyotes in Canada versus the coyotes in Georgia are gonna have a, a drastic difference. But in general, it's cute fuzzy things and about a pound of cute fuzzy things a day. And so if we're talking about ground squirrels, uh, in the summertime, a lot of our coyotes, at least in the, and especially in the past, our coyotes would focus on trying to catch two or three good sized, either golden mantled ground squirrels or a Wyoming ground squirrel. And that's all you need for the day, which is pretty amazing. So if you've had a very successful day, um, you might find a coyote's only been hunting for a few hours and then they're done. Once they're done, they can sit down and relax with the family, do some territorial displays. And so here, like a Colorado chipmunk, definitely big. The least chipmunk is, a, is another big part that you'll see them hunting. Um, one of those things that I'll, I've definitely seen is the coyotes will stick around the berry bushes in August when the least in the Colorado chipmunks are eating those berries. And you can get a, a berry filled chipmunk, which is a, a double dip. Um, they definitely hunt marmots and we, we see them hunting on the tundra. There's been more and more activity of coyotes on the tundra. Um, as animals are moving higher because it impacts the climate change. But there's research and, and a lot of documentation that shows our coyotes have been up in the high country for many thousands of years. And so uh, the marmots are absolutely a target. The Wyoming ground squirrel is a fascinating topic in itself. Uh, these guys are not native to Rocky Mountain National Park. They first showed up in the Estes Park in 1903 and then moved into the National Park around 1911 and they actually displaced the golden mantled ground squirrel in the lower elevations. But what makes these guys a really fascinating target for predators is they're one of the longest hibernators in the national park at about eight months. They just came out of hibernation about a week and a half ago. And if you hibernate for an extraordinarily long period of time, you don't have a lot of brain power. Your brain takes up a lot of calories. And so these guys sadly are dumb as rocks. And I've watched them with extraordinary short attention spans hide after seeing a predator and poke their head right back out looking for an opportunity um, to, to eat. And then that coyote will sit there and wait. And so when golden mantle ground squirrels are prolific, coyotes are honestly almost easy to find. And sadly, our 2013 flood caused a large percentage of their population to die off. Any area that was in the floodplain uh, resulted in these guys dying off because they hibernate at the end of August. And of course, when the flood hit in September, their populations dropped somewhere between 85 to 95 percent. And so they're slowly regenerating and coming back. And since they only reproduce once during the spring, uh, the, that number takes a very long time. So I'm desperately waiting for Wyoming ground squirrels to get really common again, uh, because we'll start to see a lot more predators. And then go down to lower elevations. There's a few fox squirrels even here, but we'll find a whole lot of animal activity uh, in these areas. And so, like I said, they will chase anything. They can't climb trees the way a gray fox can, but they can go up a branch or two. Um, and so anything on the ground, especially abert squirrels, uh, will spend a good amount of time on the ground and you'll see um, definitely predation opportunities for these guys. And so sadly, on that same idea, our Abert squirrel populations have gone down quite a bit because of a lot of changes, but I've seen them be a target. Um, uh, pine squirrels are absolutely a target uh, of opportunity. And so in the winter times, the coyotes will move through the snow and to the point where they actually follow tracks with snowshoers on the trails. 
And so anything you come across in the wintertime, there's definitely a lot of mouse activity, snowshoe hare activity, and these pine squirrels are coming down to the ground as they get to their middens for their cones that they've stored. And I always like to joke that the pine squirrels, without a doubt, is the most aggressive uh, animal in Rocky Mountain National Park. They will bark and yell at you because they literally put all of their food in one basket. You know, they put all their eggs in one basket in the sense of cones, three to 8,000 cones in one midden. Um, and it's just a pile of cones that they've eaten in the past, all those scale debris uh, down there. And so they're extraordinarily vocal. And so it's one of these things I also love to talk about. If you're gonna see predators, one of the best ways is to listen to the prey. And so if you hear a chattering pine squirrel, see what's going on. It might be a fox or a coyote. Um, beavers are a fascinating target for a lot of these predators and especially coyotes. Um, we know actually uh, to their cousins, the wolves, about 20% of a wolf's diet in the Rocky Mountains can consist of beavers. They're, they're effectively wolf snacks. And so coyotes will take more advantage of, the, of their young, but these guys are pretty good size. And, and honestly, a coyote and a, and a beaver weigh almost the same size as adults. So an adult beaver weighs about 35 pounds, but the, the young are definitely viable targets and something to watch for anytime you get to, get to spend some time with the, coyote, with the, the beavers. But a huge part of a coyote's diet is going to be mice. Getting a mouse picture is pretty tough, but here's some mouse tracks. And so one of those amazing things to think about, if we're talking that a coyote eats about a pound to a pound and a half of food a day, that equates to about 30 mice a day in the wintertime. And so one of those things that I love to talk about is, yes, a coyote could kill an elk and definitely can kill deer, but what makes more sense? Trying to kill 30 mice in a day, which is a lot of work, but having an extraordinarily low chance of dying from mouse attack, or trying to kill an elk that in one kick could definitely kill you right back. And so I love to talk about this mindset that uh, uh, predator and prey relationships and almost every animal interaction is based on economics. And it might take a lot more time to catch those mice, but you have a very high survival rate on catching a whole lot of mice. Moraine Park was studied in the 1990s, and the estimate there was that it had 1.3 million rodents, which is an extraordinary number. And that was owned by that one coyote pack of about six animals. So an extraordinary amount of opportunity. To me, it's like living in the grocery store. This is the only picture uh, series that I have of a pocket gopher. And so pocket gophers are pretty good sized animals, not quite a pound in size, but um, surprisingly large for being underground. And there's the only picture I have of one and it happens to be in the mouth of a coyote. And so these guys are really amazing. They, they are fossorial animals is a great word you might never use again, but to live underground most of their life, they only spend about 5% of their lives above ground. Anytime you see those dirt mounds out, that is very often a Northern pocket gopher. And so these guys are a major target of coyotes. It's a lot more meat than eating 30 mice if you can find them. And so a lot of our meadows and honestly, a lot of our yards are good habitat for uh, pocket gophers and pocket gophers live across the entire United States. And so there's a profile view and see it's, it's a respectable sized little cute bugger that sadly we don't get to see very often. Um, and of course, coyotes are gonna eat rabbits, um, huge part of their diet, especially in Canada, we find that coyotes and the, the lynx and bobcat are tied very closely to snowshoe hares, but our mountain cottontails are absolutely a target and uh, very easy um, for the, the young to get targeted for food. Snowshoe hares are one of these animals from a, a coyote target that I know I have personally killed a snowshoe hare by my negligence. Because if you watch really early in the morning in uh, snowshoeing areas with some fresh snow, you'll see that the coyotes will walk on that track that we've made in our snowshoes. And so this particular rabbit might have been my victim. I'm not sure, sadly, but uh, this is a, a guy that was, that was around uh, the Bear Lake area. And all of a sudden he was very common. And then I saw coyote tracks in his spot and I never saw him again. And so, you know, for a volleyball sized animal, that's a lot of good food. And what we find often is the coyotes will follow our tracks in the, at night when the, when the, the, um, uh, pardon me, the, the snowshoe hares are really, really active. 
And so something to be cautious and considerate of is how much do we go off trail in certain areas? And I've tried to reduce that myself with myself and my clients in the areas we go to try to keep the snowshoe hares at least to have an advantage. Because what's amazing, a snowshoe hare can run about 35 miles an hour on snow. A coyote can only about 25 to 28 on snow, about 38 on land, on, on solid ground though. So a really kind of amazing target. We don't have them up here, but jackrabbits are definitely also a target. And um, this is a, a story I always love to share. If, if you've never spent any time with jackrabbits, uh, almost all of rabbits' eyes will shine back red uh, in a flashlight. And so if you're ever walking in lower elevations and you see a giant devil red eye staring back at you, it might be a good sized jackrabbit. Um, and then up in the high country, pikas are definitely a target for a lot of our, a lot of our coyotes and of course other predators. Um, and these guys, you'll listen to them barking. And so anytime you get an opportunity to listen to animals that vocalize as prey, you want to listen and pay attention. And that's how you're going to find predators. And so about half the coyotes I see on the tundra is because of the marmots and the pikas barking like crazy. So little uh, participant interaction. Um, what is this? Just unmute. Dusky grouse? Dusky grouse. Yes. Very good. Because everybody says, look at that ptarmigan. <laughs> and so I always ask, were you above tree line or not? And uh, the answer is, if you're not above tree line, it's almost always a dusky grouse. So this is maybe our least understood bird uh, by a lot of folks because they're always wanting to see a ptarmigan. And so these guys are really uh, a good sized bird, about the size of a chicken. And man, oh man, do they make for good food. And what's fascinating, Native Americans often talk about that they would use dusky grouse as a survival strategy, um, that you can actually hunt these guys by walking up behind them and grabbing them by the neck. They don't run away from bipedal predators. Quadrupeds, on the other hand, like a coyote, is definitely a target. And I've, I've seen them flying away from coyotes once or twice. Um, but on that ptarmigan side, up in the high country, you definitely can get, you know, targeted. Anything, like I said, is going to be a, a target for ptarmigan or for coyotes. So especially ptarmigan chicks can be a, a, a part of their food source at different times of year. So always kind of cool to see those guys. And then, like I said, almost everything is food. And so anything smaller than a coyote is potential food as well. So we don't have many raccoons in the Estes Valley, but they definitely do exist here. And so raccoons, uh, even foxes can be targets, but every predator that is equal or smaller to them in size is definitely on the diet. And so uh, seeing a, a weasel is amazing, but seeing a coyote chase a weasel is extraordinary. I've only seen that once. Uh, and definitely we have to talk about this idea. Not only will coyotes kill foxes, they rarely eat them entirely, but there's this idea of clade competition inside the same family, you will find uh, coyotes kill foxes, wolves kill coyotes. And so controlling populations, if we get wolves, hopefully sometime in the next you know, 10 to 25 years, uh, we should start to see a lot more foxes in the Estes Valley because unfortunately our coyote population restricts the fox population quite drastically, especially by the rivers. And so foxes get to take a brunt of our coyote activity. But not only do they eat cute fuzzy things on the small side, Cute fuzzy things on the big side are definitely a target. Um, and so lambs are definitely a target for coyotes. And uh, in, in Sheep Lakes area, there's Morning Rock where we know uh, many years ago, a uh, uh, ewe was on top of that rock uh, bawling for her lamb that was sadly killed by a coyote. Um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of coyote activity in Horseshoe Park around sheep coming down to Sheep Lakes. So definitely something to, to keep an eye out for. Um, Across the United States, coyotes are heavily blamed for deer population um, impacts. And I would argue that almost everybody can find that deer aren't doing too bad across the United States. And so like this little mule deer fawn, they, they will target them, but a mama deer at about a hundred pounds is, is definitely a formidable uh, defender. Uh, getting up into elk, you have to be quite wily. And I've never seen any documentation of coyotes going after a healthy moose calf but definitely deer fawns are a major target. 
And so what's amazing is this is my neighborhood. This is my drive, my neighbor's driveway. And so like a lot of us, we have mule deer that just live in our neighborhood. And I never see them whenever I see a coyote walking down the street, of course. Um, now, on the other side, we have to talk about this quick idea that predators always target males after mating season. So here's a buck, big and beautiful, at the prime of his life. But at the end of the mating season, this female, uh, pardon me, this male is going to be heavily depleted. He's spent a lot of time chasing around females and especially chasing off other males. So one of those amazing ideas that not many people are familiar with is that in a breeding cycle for hooved animals, the amount of time that a female hooved animal is actually fertile, not estrus, estrus was releasing scent, but actually fertility, depending on the species is six to 18 hours. And so you have this extraordinarily short time to get a girl pregnant. And so during that time, you have to be an amazing looking guy like this mule deer here, and then that all happens in the span of roughly a day. About 80% of females get pregnant on their first cycle in the ungulate family for the deer and the sheep. Um, and so these males are putting all of this effort into literally hours of a female's life so that they can try to reproduce. And that means after mating season, they're heavily easy targeted uh, prey because they're weak and exhausted and often sick. And so uh, if we get really heavy snow, mule deer buck are a real common target for coyotes in our ecosystem because they're the weak ones. And honestly, that's how we get uh, uh, population dynamics with, uh, you know, this, that same buck will generally not make it if he's been extremely reproductive and then older. And so that way you don't get the same guy being in charge and doing most of the breeding. And we see that quite often. But without a doubt, you know, seeing uh, elk calves is a major part of their diet. But what a lot of us forget about, we, we like to think about, you know, babies are vulnerable, but a lot of babies are stillborn. And so the live calves are definitely a target and you will see them at every ecosystem be targeted by coyotes. But here's another graphic picture coming up. This was a very happy coyote that found a stillborn elk uh, in Moraine Park. And so uh, as a, almost like a trophy, it was eating every little part of this elk calf. Uh, but it, the elk calf died at birth, and we see that those uh, stillborn rates are going to depend on the year, depending on the food, how healthy that adult female elk was on survival. But we might have a, a loss of somewhere about 30 to 45 percent of the fawns and the calves in that first few weeks. And so that leads to a lot of food for our coyotes. If we were in Yellowstone, that's how we would see a lot of grizzly bears and, and wolves. But if we get lucky, sometimes you see a coyote doing that. But then we got to talk about food that you wouldn't quite think of. Grasshoppers and other insects make up a huge part of their diet, especially when you're trying to teach the puppies how to hunt. And so we will see this quite often that they will target grasshoppers. And so really early on when parents are trying to teach the puppies how to hunt, you uh, give them grasshoppers to chase after and that's how they learn how to pounce. But then here's the part where people don't think about. Coyotes are carnivores, but they do eat berries. And one of my favorite facts I've ever discovered in researching animals is that the number one cause of crop damage for watermelons in Georgia is coyotes. And they love eating watermelons. And so quite often in a watermelon patch, you'll see a few bites out of a watermelon rind all the way down a row. And so uh, they can cause damage, unfortunately, but it may not always be the type that we'd think of them killing sheep or chickens, but you know, it's definitely, they're, they're vegetarians as well. Up to 80% of their diet can be vegetative matter, especially in that August timeframe when it's berry season. And then what's really interesting is a coyote can't tell uh, the color red. They are dichromic creatures. They can see yellow, green, and they can see blue, but they don't see red, orange, or purple. And so how do you tell a berry is ripe? by the color. So the only way to know is you got to eat a lot of berries off of one bush and they can be quite bitter at times if they're not quite ripe. And then a huge part of their diet, if available, is carrion. And so elk that don't make it, deer that don't make it through the winter are going to be scavenged on. And so in the winter time, this is one of the things to definitely keep an eye out for is a joker red smile below their chin. That always tells you that there's a scavenging opportunity somewhere 
And in this ecosystem, I've come to find that lasts about three days that you can potentially find a coyote on a carcass. And so their nature's recyclers. They're taking a lot of that resource. And so when an animal dies, that's going to feed the puppies and going to feed the family. And they're extraordinarily defensive about that. So the magpies and the, the ravens, it's another idea that because we don't have wolves in our ecosystem, we'll see a lot of these animals moving around uh, the a carcass. So you watch for magpies and ravens and crows. Um, and then here's the part where it gets really fascinating. They will store food for the future. They're relatively intelligent animals at intelligence level about of a two-year-old child. And so what's really fascinating is they'll take a part of a carcass and then hide it somewhere else. In a world with wolves or other predators, they have to worry about being killed themselves. So especially if and when we get our wolves back, uh, we'll see that an elk will go down and a coyote might just take a leg and off it goes. Uh, one of the more fascinating things is they'll take the most nutritious parts. And so liver is highly desirable by a lot of animals and humans also uh, will eat some liver, really high in minerals. And so this is a process of a coyote taking parts of the liver and then actually burying it and hiding it. But here's the part that's amazing. We know they lie. Lying is have to have enough forethought that you hide and bury food over time. And so we can actually watch this coyote do that over and over again with different carcass parts that could come back for food. And so definitely something to watch for, like I said, joker red smile. And then those carcasses lead to a lot of other cool sightings like the golden eagle that is a relatively rare sighting in the park. Um, so on to cuteness. If you got like coyotes, you gotta like puppies. And so this is just a really quick diorama of, of pictures as they go through their life cycle, as they're very young, little brown buggers. Um, this was mom and dad moving coyotes. They often move their den multiple times, sometimes two to three times in the denning cycle. It's a 63 day gestation period and then about another two and a half months that they're in the den. And so where a den is found, you might not find them again in that spot because they may have moved. And so during flood season, I watched this one family move these coyote pups that were just a few weeks old. Their eyes are just open. At about eight weeks, you're starting to move around a whole lot. And so this is just a, a set of pictures of you watch as these different puppies over the years of dens I've been able to find um, get to grow up. And so when mom and dad come with food, they're generally in the den, act behaving. And so they show up, they give a little yelp, and that little yelp creates a little coyote volcano. They come out, uh, nurse and play and wrestle. And then what's really interesting, if you've ever been around a dog, they will lick the corner of your mouth quite often. And dogs that are licky, that licky behavior is to say, hey, I love you, please throw up. And then the parents will involuntarily regurgitate. So when your dog licks you, it's trying to say, please throw up so I can eat that. And so we see that in wild canines quite a bit. As they uh, get a lot bigger, they start looking a whole lot like, honestly, little dogs. And they show a lot of the behaviors that we see in dogs, like dominance display like this. Um, and they run around like little maniacs. My favorite thing too is uh, when you see a den, in the beginning, they're very protective and they stay in the den and they listen. But then they get to their teenager phase, the second mom and dad leave, they come out and run around. And then when they get caught, they run back to the den and then come out and wait for their greeting from mom and dad. Um, and so this is that moment as mom and dad show back up and then we get a nice little greeting moment again. And so, like I said, something to watch for is they are a family. And so the more that we interact and change their behavior, we can definitely impact their family dynamics and so protecting every animal in that family is really important to keeping stable ecosystems. Uh, we can create a single mom or a single dad, and that's when we start getting trouble with livestock and other issues. And so they do have a lot of competitors. Um, a lot of different animals are gonna target them. Um, so especially wolves, if and when we ever get our wolves back, that will be an impact to our coyote populations and we'll see coyotes less in the open environments but in the road environments, in the town environments, we'll start to see the coyotes come back. This is a wolf up in Yellowstone. Um, and so when the wolves do show up, they will start to be the apex predator. And the coyotes spend a lot of time in Yellowstone right along the road. Um, foxes are also going to eat small, cute, fuzzy animals. And so a lot of competition there with our foxes. Um, 
This is my only and best picture of a mountain lion. And so there is some competition with deer, uh, with, with coyotes. Um, bobcats, interestingly, generally eat higher than their body weight, whereas coyotes generally eat lower than their body weight. And so we'll see that quite often, that they are in the same ecosystem, but compete only when conditions are kind of harder. Badgers, not only do they compete for the same food, they actually have been known to cooperate and hunt together which is a really awesome idea that we'll see ever so rarely. I've never witnessed it, but read about it quite a bit. And so coyotes got a lot of work to do. The other thing I wanna talk about really quick before I get into the question moment is coyotes are worth a lot of money to our ecosystem. Uh, doing an off the cuff uh, calculation, they're about $25 billion of economic value because of all the rodents that they're killing that would cause crop damage. And I can go into some really great detail if anybody's really curious, but the mouse war of Klamath County, Oregon is a fascinating research on the ecology of how uh, an animal is worth a lot of money that we then tried to poison all the mice. Then we poison the dogs and the kids. Uh, and then I don't have any domestic sheep pictures, but of course sheep uh, uh, competition is also an issue. The grand irony here, we spend about $85 million to kill animals in wildlife in the it's called the wildlife services and um, if we would just take half of that money and give it to ranchers for the losses we would actually be ahead of the game uh, or if we bought donkeys llamas or the right species of dogs there would be almost no losses for sheep and so there is a value that these animals play and the last thing i want to talk about really quick before we get to questions is you know that that future that we're going to hopefully experience in the next decade or two of getting wolves here. And so we will start to see less coyotes because they will start to get impacted population wise. Um, and so something that we can watch for is, so right now is a great time to enjoy our coyote friends before these wolves hopefully show up and produce a whole different experience. And so we'll see what our coyote future has to hold, but I'll uh, open the, the chat session up for any questions and Anything in particular that you find curious? So, Jared, I did have a couple questions that were sent in ahead of time. Okay. Um, the first one being, have you noticed an increase or decrease in the coyote population in recent years? So inside the national park, I've definitely noticed a pretty drastic decrease. And um, I keep notes of what I see every day. And so I have about 18 years of notes. And that um, the number one thing is coyote sightings went from about a 75% of the time down to about a 20% time. And that change I would make is, is tied to a few different factors. The, the Wyoming ground squirrel population decline um, means that they're in the woods a lot more than in the meadow. And so from a visibility standpoint, we see them less. But the other thing that we have going on is our elk population have been migrating. You know, it's a fascinating idea that, that our elk are now in Loveland most of the winter. And so since carrion is a huge part of their winter diet, uh, the coyotes have been following the elk herd a little bit and then of course switching to different food types. And so that should lead to a lower pup count. And so um, I definitely have noticed, at least in the national park, a pretty drastic change. Um, but in the Estes Park area, coyotes are definitely going to rely on a lot of garbage and rodents and, you know, our, our yards make for perfect rodent habitat. And so I haven't noticed too much of a change in town, but definitely in the, in the more natural areas. Um, that will change again. Um, another question from the chat, have coyotes ever been domesticated? Yes, Native Americans. Uh, almost all of their dogs uh, in the Western United States are some form of coyote. And so uh, if you study coyote evolution, the, the branch is coyote, then wolf, and then dog off a of wolf. And so how do you get a dog is you take the wolf parts and then you breed out the wolf parts to get back to the more primitive coyote ancestor. And so a lot of the things that we love about our dogs is coyote behavior, or at least a coyote ancestor analog. And so the barking, the tail wagging, a lot of that is, is dogs. And so, yes, we definitely see that in the, 
um, domestication. And, you know, if you read a lot of the older stories, people did have a pet coyote from the 1800s. <laughs> Jared, I do have one question, um, just a personal experience where I have seen um, a pack of coyotes work together where a maybe a, a group of three to four to five would play around, roll around to distract their prey and have two or threes go behind the prey and stalk up on them. And in this case, it was our neighbor's chihuahuas. Um, is that something that is often common um, in the wild as well, where they distract um, and then have others go back and attack or? or yeah, dance? yeah. One of the more fascinating things I've ever read is a tactic of pack hunting for mule deer, where they will run a mule deer. Mule deer will often come back to their territory as they're running away. And so they will actually go into a relay system. And so they run until the coyote is exhausted and they will literally run the mule deer down into the mule deer exhausted and then kill it through exhaustion. Um, we'll see that. Uh, uh, the other thing that I've absolutely witnessed is not only do the coyotes themselves use distractions, like in the sense of coyotes on coyotes, I've absolutely watched where the Wyoming ground squirrels in, in the valleys in the park are hanging out watching all the people. And I've watched coyotes not run, but literally walk up to a distracted ground squirrel and just eat them outright. And, and so that, that was during high, you know, the preparation for migration or hibernation season. I don't see that much anymore, but I watched that at least 20 or 30 times in the past. <laughs> and so there is definitely documentation of them working together. Um, it, in Yellowstone, we know that there, before the wolves were introduced in 95, they were hunting as a pack uh, and hunting elk successfully, like adult healthy elk. And so they absolutely can work together in really aggressive forms. But if you don't have to, kill mice is a lot easier solution. But yeah, definitely that it is without a doubt something that has been documented many times. Right, great, Very thank cool. you. Thanks. And Richard, did you have a question? Um, yes, I have, I'm Sandra. Um, I'm curious, I'm thinking about- Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm wondering if the leader of the pack is always a male or female, or how does that work? So, so the guy who literally wrote the book, Mech, on, on packs has refuted his own research. That was his young research. A pack is a family. And so mom and dad roughly are equal in, uh, in a coyote side of things. Mom and dad are equal on that. There's no one leader, right? Now in wolves, in attacking bigger prey, there is definitely a leader of the attack, but we don't, haven't spread any evidence that it shows that. But um, in that family structure, dad plays a huge role in bringing food to mom, especially when the pups are in the den. And so we definitely see that idea of partnership. You know, I always like to say that if you believe in the romance of monogamism, coyotes and maybe beavers are your target animal to try to model your relationship on because they will spend the whole rest of their life with that partner if they can make it work. Generally, the reason it doesn't work is you die, sadly. And so, but if you live, you get to spend your whole life with that one partner. And so they're mostly monogamous because of how hard their life is. And so um, it's a partnership, which is really cool. All right, I'm waiting for a clarification on one more question. Um, we have another one though, I heard about wolves and coyotes breeding with each other in the Northeastern United States. Yeah, so in that crazy Jurassic Park, nature will find a way in literally our lifetimes, a new species is evolving. And so in the last about 30 years, the Eastern coyote, the koi wolf, there's 10 different names that you might find, but it is a coyote that has moved into the Eastern United States, started to breed with Canadian wolves uh, and a little bit of dog DNA. And so now we have a 65 pound-ish wolf coyote that hunts deer, as well as all the other things that coyotes often eat. And so what's amazing is guess how big the Eastern wolf used to be? About 65 pounds. And so the, the Western wolves are definitely larger. 
And so nature just took all the parts and pieces. I mean, that's the beauty of evolution is, is you don't, you don't find, uh, uh, you don't make a system. You just find the problems and take the parts you have and throw in a new solution. And so mother nature absolutely has made uh, a, a successful Kai koi wolf. I like Eastern coyote. They genetically, they're more of a coyote than a wolf, um, but they are definitely there and slowly taking over the Eastern seaboard. They're from Canada, Canada all the way down into about Delaware and Virginia now. I saw that question, are they making their way west? No, uh, they're only in the Northeast right now. Um, another question, could you talk about the impacts to coyotes, people using um, poisons to kill rodents, um, as well as people using the buckets of water to get rid of mice and bulls in their yard? Well, the best I can say is that, that poison will travel throughout the ecosystem. And so it's really important to understand the idea of trophic levels. Uh, uh, the bottom, the producers, you know, if you got your, your mice and whatever are in that middle layer, you start poisoning them, that poison will concentrate as you go up. And so um, a perfect example is that idea of the, of the mouse war in Oregon. In the, in the 1940s, after the boys came back from World War II, the, they, the, the um, uh, 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 mom, my brain will not work on the, the, the warrant, they, they would get money I can't think of that word for some reason. I'm having a George Bush moment. Um, <laughs> they would get, they would get bounty. Tea. Yeah, the bounty. bounty. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you get, if you brought in both ears, you got a bounty. And they were so effective because these guys coming back from World War II were good shots that they literally killed all of the coyotes in this county. And in the span of a decade, that county, which is mostly farmers, it was, it was Southeast Oregon, I got somewhere into the realm of $23 million of crop losses. And this is in the 1950s. And so instead of saying, hey, we killed all the coyotes, what if we just poison all the mice? And so instead of solving the problem, thinking backwards, they, they move forward. And then of course, not only were they poisoning all the mice, they were poisoning snow geese and children and dogs and cows as this poison was traveling everywhere because there was about 10,000 mice per acre in some of these areas. And so the sad reality is at the end, they realized in the late 1950s that they should just reintroduce coyotes and like magic, the problem went away. And so, you know, the best I can tell you is leave nature alone and it will be free. And, um, you know, the coyotes, that's the biggest thing is get, get the coyotes and the foxes in your yard and the red tail hawks and the bobcats in your yard if you have mice problems. And if they're in the house, you know, traps in the house can be viable. But, you know, trying to fight nature, especially here with this last year, I've seen so many mice in 2020, but poison rarely is a successful answer. It's more about yard manipulation and maybe changing what you have. That can help a whole lot. But poison is almost never the right answer because it will go up the line and cause a lot of other damage. That is all the questions from the chat. Did anyone else have any? Uh, so I had a question on the family units. So do those go multi-generational? Like would you have like kids and grandkids? And then um, so once that, and then also once that next generation is born, how does that dispersal work? So if there's like the grandkids that are still around, would they get driven off by the parents or would they just leave on their own? Or so would it be documentation of dependent? It's always been two, right? And so the, the rule of thumb, this is where coyote research gets really complicated is it's very habitat driven. Go somewhere in the Great Plains where every coyote that leaves gets shot and you might disperse literally that, that next spring or even into the winter time. Go into areas like we have in the national park where our coyotes are very protected and they could actually uh, uh, stay indefinitely. Like that research shows two years 
And so the, the movement in those scenarios is the, the draw and urge to mate pushes that animal out. But in environments where everybody's getting shot all the time, everybody disperses and we see a very quick movement and also a huge population decline as those younger ones don't know how to hide from people and are targeted by predators and hit by cars. Um, but on the other side, uh, uh, those multiple, multiple generation brothers and sisters raising their, young, their, their sisters and siblings lower down, it has been observed of females, uh, sisters nursing their own, their puppies of their, their next generation, the next year's siblings, um, which is a really fascinating idea to actually nurse your sister is not very common in nature. Um, but it does, it has been seen, but only in extraordinarily stable ecosystems. And so the more unstable it is, the more you move, uh, the higher the food concentration, the less you have to move. And so territory size also shrinks. And so that your question is fascinating because in some parts of the Great Plains, coyote territories might be 25 square miles. And here there's sometimes as small as one square mile. And so how far away do you go is very relative to your habitat. And yeah, just break out any book and there's, there's every coyote book I have has a list of how far away do you go from home and how, what is their success rate. And if you look at where these studies are, it's different every state that they're in. And so it's in, entirely based on your habitat. Um, but generally mom and dad kick you out if you're not productive <laughs> or if there's not enough food. And that would be in December, in the, especially in this ecosystem. Wow, well, this has been really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it very much for all your questions and interest. And, and uh, I'm sorry I went over a little bit of time. I'm not good at staying on time. That's my, I always go more. <laughs> okay, no problem at all. Real quick before we um, let everybody go, just wanted to let everyone know we do have another talk next week. This one will be on Earth Day kind of in honor of Earth Day, um, talking about how water and how it goes through Estes Park. So please uh, maybe put that on your calendar. You can go to our website, evwatershed.org and check out our events page. Um, thank you, Jared, for all the great information. I thought that was a wonderful talk. I learned a whole lot about coyotes. So thank, thank you, you guys very much. Yeah, the absolutely. Time. Thank you. And Willen, can I just can I just yeah. jump in, Willen? Um, the talk next week is free, so uh, you don't have to be a Wandering Wildlife Society member. So pass that information on to everybody. Uh, some good information about water, and uh, we'll see you that at that next meeting or that next talk. Sounds awesome. And if you and and I don't know, Willen, I'm going to jump in. But and if you haven't done so yet. The Rotary Duck Race is coming up, and we would love to have you buy a flock, or maybe even just or adopt a flock or a duck or two, and uh, be sure to pick the Essex Valley Watershed Coalition. <laughs> we get $19 for every $22 adoption, and you get some really good prizes out there too. So just keep us in mind. Everybody have a good evening. Um, let me know if you would like a link to watch the recording and thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. You. All right. Great. Yeah, thanks so that much. That was awesome. That was great. All right. I'll see you next time.